current customers. Oh, that's adorable. Yes, yeah, like, yeah, yes. What? I can't believe they posted that. Oh my gosh. What? Unlike, unfriend. Oh my gosh. Can't believe they do that. I am so done with social media. Choosing FinCorp, we are thrilled that we can help you resolve your social media issue. What? That costs like a thousand bucks. What? That's my phone. Why'd you do that? Hey, lady, this phone works like a champ, and it will certainly bring your stress levels down. This is a toy. What? How am I supposed to call my sister? You're welcome. That's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, welcome to week three of I'm So Done. And today we're talking about what to do when I'm just so done with ineffective parenting. And uh, yeah, I'm super looking forward to today. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Zoit Trisha. Mini is a boot, Ivan. No, sorry. Hello. My name is Ivan. FinCorp is fire engine of delivery services. We are very loud and flashy, and most of the time, everything on fire. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Do you know why fire engines are red? Uh, no, why are fire engines red? Fire engines are red because they have six wheels and two drivers. Six times two equals 12. There are 12 inches in ruler. Queen Elizabeth is also ruler. Queen Elizabeth is also a ship. Ships sail in sea, fish swim in sea. Fish have fins, fins live in Finland. The Russians and Finns are always fighting. We share border in common. We know Russians are red. Fire engines are always a Russian. There you have it, sign here. <laughs> I don't know how I can argue with that kind of logic, really. So You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Ivan. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, let's get started. Hey, have you ever felt like your parenting is just totally ineffective and you're just simply not getting through to your kids and to your teenagers? Well, today, our Heavenly Father is going to show us how... Um, he can help us to become more effective at parenting, especially parenting over the long haul. Not that there's not going to be isolated incidents of difficulty. There are. Um, but we'll become much more effective at parents, especially at setting our kids off on the right path. Um, you know, years ago, I was listening to uh, a podcast by Andy Stanley on parenting. And by the way, what he says about parenting uh, applies whether a person is a Christ follower or not a Christ follower. Um, and he was talking about how he and his wife had stated a goal about their parenting. And once they actually stated their goal, 
like it changed everything that they did from that point forward. And then he said, hey, so listeners, do you have a goal for your parenting? And I'm driving the car, and I'm thinking, <laughs> survival? Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, for me and for the kids, I mean, I, I don't know. Then I'm, then I'm thinking like, well, I mean, I guess is that I want them to be, you know, good people. I want them to, you know, follow Jesus and I guess be happy. Um, and, then, and then, no kidding, Andy goes, and just in case you said that your goal is for your kids to be good people and to follow Jesus and to be happy, let me challenge you to change your goal. And I was like, man, I'm on the edge of my seat now. I'm like, come on, Andy, hit me with it, baby. Let's go. What, what's the deal? And he said, um, years ago, my wife and I decided that we would have a different goal for parenting. Okay? He said that, um, he said early on, we decided that our goal was that when we got to the end, that we would be friends with our kids. That we would be friends with our kids. And that way, you know, if they ever, you know, did get off the rails, that there would be a friendship to fall back on so that we could speak into their lives. Because without, you know, without a friendship, there's no avenue with which to speak to you, into your kids' lives. He said, and by the way, we want our kids to want to be friends back with us. And like, I'm in the car, and I'm like wiping tears. So I was like, I want to be friends with my kids too, Andy. And so, I mean, I'm telling you, like, it was an emotional and a watershed moment for me. And then Andy said this. He gave a, a warning. He said, now let me warn you, parents. He said, um, the problem I see is that so many parents try to be friends with their kids too early. Because if you try to be friends with your kids too early, early and you don't stay their parents, then um, it actually leads to problems. Because if you try to be friends with them early on, you end up being parents to them later. But if you'll stay a parent early on, you know, through young adults, then you can be friends later. And I was like, wow, that, like, that is that is so wise. And so today, we're going to learn how God, is, how God wants us to be effective in our parenting. And if we do things his way, not only will our kids grow up to be you know, good people and follow Jesus and be happy, but we can be friends with them in the end. And it all starts... Uh, with our theme verse for this entire series. So go ahead and pull out your message notes. Um, and I want us to say our theme verse, Exodus 14, 14, out loud together. In fact, I want everybody to say it, including those who are watching online. Exodus 14, 14. Let's say it out loud, okay? Ready, go. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need only to be still. Now, in the context of what we're talking about today, you know, be still means that you resist the temptation to take matters in your own hands and do what you think is right or do what your parents did. Instead, you would be patient and trust God's process and do it his way, knowing that he's fighting for us as parents and he's fighting for our kids as well. Because, look, I mean, all of us get to the point where we're just like, oh, I'm just so done with parenting. I mean, don't we all get to that point? I mean, we're tired, and the kids, like, they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing the boundaries. And, like, we are just so sick of it because, you know, they just keep doing the same wrong thing over and over and over and over and over again. Like, they're not listening to us. And finally, we just get to the point where we just, like, throw up our hands. We're like, fine. You want to do it your way? Have at it. See how that works out for you. We all, only, we all get to the point. And look, and when we get to that point, that is when we need God to step in and fight for us. But the key is to follow his way of parenting. Listen, there will be times of frustration. But if we parent like God says, listen, the long-term cumulative effect 
will be amazing. And I can't, while I can't offer a guarantee, more than likely when we get to the end, not only will our kids be good people and follow Jesus and be happy, but we'll be friends. And that's a great goal for parenting. And look, and, it, and even if you have kids who are older or maybe you're just getting a you know, late jump on some of this, you haven't done much of this, listen, it's never too late to start because God will fight for you. He says he will. And you can still end up being good friends with your kids. So how does God want me to parent my kids? Well, today we've got several items in our box that will help us. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff that's going to help us. So, so we're going to use these to illustrate what God's saying to us. And so here, I want you to write down the first point. The first thing that I've got to do is this. Number one, write it down. I need to talk openly about God and Jesus. I need to talk openly about God and Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning of verse 6, it says this. It says, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them. Look, there's an old adage that says that Christianity is better caught than taught. Christianity is better caught than taught. And by the way, that is absolutely true. Basically, here's the thing. If your kids don't see you following Jesus, they are probably not going to follow Jesus. I mean, think about it. If you took your kids to church every single Sunday and never missed, but you never mention God or Jesus at home, you never share a prayer request, you never pray over a meal, like you never talk about what you're learning in the Bible or what you learned at church or what you learned at small group, you never talk about any of that kind of stuff at home. What your kids learn is that God is an activity that you do only on a Sunday, but has no bearing on the other six days a week at all. That's what they end up learning. So let me tell you one thing that Amy and I did to combat that and uh, to to teach about that. I want to use this car because um, what Amy and I did when our kids were small, by the way, we started this when they were in pre-K, When we would drive the kids to school, on the way to school, we would ask them, hey, what is one thing that we can pray about for you today? And it didn't matter what that one thing was. And whatever that was, like we would take a few moments in the car right then on the way to school and we'd pray for them. And then when they got a little bit older, you know, like second grade, We would still do the whole prayer request thing, but then we would pray, and then we would ask them also to pray out loud. And that got our kids comfortable with praying out loud at an early age. And then when they got a little bit older, like fourth grade, I would um, ask them to turn to a, 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 a verse in the book of Proverbs, and we would talk about how that verse applied to life. And then we would do our prayer request time. See, essentially what we did was we would talk openly about God or about Jesus in the car. We turned off the radio, turned off all the stuff, and that was some time we dedicated to just that. And here's what it did. Listen, it normalized talking about God and Jesus in our family. So it felt very normal to bring up a prayer request at home. It felt very normal to talk about what I learned at church. It, talk, it felt very normal to talk about you know, like what I learned you know, reading the Bible. It felt very normal to talk about what I learned at small group. Because, by the way, it is normal. It is normal. And so it normalized all of that great stuff. Because, you see, God is not something you leave at church. God is a part of our lives every day because he loves us so much. He loves you so much, and he wants to be a part of every day of your life. So listen, so start talking openly about God and about Jesus, especially in the car. And listen, you can use the discussion questions that we provide for you that are on the back of your message notes. 
You can use those in the car. You can use them at lunch. You can use them at dinner. Or if your kids are in kids' ministry, they provide discussion questions through their social media every week about what they learned on Sunday. So use those things to start talking openly about God and about Jesus. And listen, later on in life, when you become friends with your kids, it'll be really easy to have meaningful discussion when you're friends because you had meaningful discussion when they were kids. See how that works? All right. Here's the second thing. Write this down. Teach. Don't just give orders. You got to teach. Don't just give orders. I want you to look at the second half of verse 7. It says this. It says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Again, talking about God and about Jesus should be normal. Make it a normal part of your conversation, okay? Not just in the car, but also at home. That's why I brought this dollhouse. You need to talk about God and about Jesus at home. And, and now, notice this verse doesn't mention church at all, does it? It doesn't even mention church. It assumes that you're going to talk about God at church, but it's critical you also talk about God and about Jesus at home. And the one thing, one way that you can do that, especially when your kids are younger, is at dinner. Now, look, I know a lot of families nowadays do dinner on the run. We did too. In fact, growing up, we probably only ate dinner as a family two, maybe three times a week, you know, just because of sports. But listen, whenever we did have dinner, we tried to maximize that time. And one of the fun things that we did at dinner time was we did role play. Because we knew that our kids were going to face temptations, you know, about like drugs and about alcohol, and those sorts of things, especially, you know, whenever they enter junior high. And so we would role play what to do whenever you're facing those sorts of situations. So, you know, like, for instance, if one of the kids was going to go, you know, spend the night with someone, we would role play. And I would often take the role of the, you know, the instigator uh, and, or the other kid. And, and now our kids, they spent night with good kids. And so this probably never happened. But, but just in case, we wanted to make sure that they were prepared. Um, and so I would say, like, like, Hey man, like my parents, like they're in bed and they're asleep and my dad keeps beer in this special refrigerator. Like, how about we go get some? I mean, I've done it before and it's really cool. And y'all, let me just tell you, like I became really good at being the tempter for my kids. Like that was, like that was my role and I was good at it. All right. And then sometimes my kids, and so we would kind of role play about what to do and what they would say, and we would guide them. And sometimes they would kind of bow up. They were like, oh, yeah, well, Dad, there's nothing that you can say that would make me want to do anything like that. You know, and they, they would just kind of get all excited about it. And it was, I know, it was really fun. It was a really good experience. But here's the thing. Here's why it was so important. Because whenever they faced those temptations out in the real world, it wasn't the first time. And so they knew how to respond because we had role play. And we'd role play all kinds of scenarios. So like, you know, what if you were offered drugs? Or what if you were pressed to go too far on a date? Or what if somebody asked you if they could copy your homework? Or if you were, you know, asked to steal something? Or if, how to respond to a bully? So listen, we didn't order our kids what to do. We taught them what to do. And we always taught told them to filter their actions through two questions. Is this what Jesus would want you to do? And is it wise? You might want to write these two things down. Okay, the two questions that we had held always filter is, is this what Jesus would want you to do? And is it wise? Because there are some things that aren't wrong. <laughs> They're just not wise. Listen, so don't just order your kids what to do. Teach them what to do. And by the way, if role-playing helps, then it helps. Okay. Here's number three. I need to utilize other voices. I need to utilize other voices. Look at this 
great verse in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 2. It says, listening to wise people increases your knowledge, but only nonsense comes from the mouths of fools. Look, we all know that at some point, your kids are going to listen to your voice less and listen to other voices more. Listen, and if the only other voices they have in their lives are the other knuckleheads that they go to school with, then they are learning about relationships and sex and honesty and integrity from the other kids in their grade. That is crazy. Which, by the way, that is exactly what this verse is saying when it says, but only nonsense comes from the mouths of fools. But the first half of the verse says, listening to wise people increases your knowledge. So the key is to have other voices in their lives. Your kids need those other voices. And listen, you have a chance as a parent to choose who those other voices are. And if you don't choose, they will choose. And they will always choose their peers. Which is why it's so important that at church, you have your kids involved in a small group. Now, this isn't just a commercial for small groups, okay? That's not what this is. I am trying to tell you that small group is a great place for your kids to hear other voices of other adults reinforcing the same biblical values and Jesus-centered living that you are trying to teach them at home. Because listen, the things that your kids are going to learn at church about generosity, and serving, and kindness, and patience. Those things are not taught anywhere else in our culture other than at home and at church. And that's it. And when there are other adults in your kids' lives, listen, it forms this holistic approach that is so compelling and so convincing that your kids intuitively know that it's true. Because listen, if they only hear it from you and they don't hear it from anywhere else, well, that's not that compelling. But listen, if they hear it from you and they hear it from their small group leader from kindergarten all the way through being a senior in high school, well, look, that is a symphony of voices that is incredibly compelling. And it's hard to ignore. So take advantage of these other voices and choose who these other voices are going to be. And in the end, you will have kids who will grow up to be wise. And by the way, it's much more fun to be friends with your kids who are wise than if they're unwise. But you got to utilize other voices to make that happen. Here's the fourth thing, last one. Discipline, don't just punish. Discipline, don't just punish. Check out these great verses about discipline. In um, Proverbs twenty-two fifteen, it says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Now, the, you know, the rod of discipline, it's not an actual rod, okay? God is not asking you to start caning your children, okay? That, that, is, that is not what this means, okay? Okay. Um, the, the rod of discipline is anything that you would use to spank your kids. And I know in our culture nowadays, it's all vogue to be against spanking, and spanking is a terrible thing. But look, you can say whatever you want to about spanking, but you have to say that it is biblical. It is. Now listen, spanking is never intended to be abusive, ever. It was never intended to be that way. Listen, it's, spanking is not abusive. Your kids are born with padding, okay? <laughs> God put it there, all right? They're, 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 they're born with it, all right? And they're, so they're, listen, there's nothing wrong with spanking them with your hand or if you find in your own version of, you know, a you know, rod of correction for us, um, as parents, our rod of correction was a, a plastic serving spoon. And we chose it because it's got a little whip in it, you know. And I'm telling you, it was effective. 
Like it worked. But listen, here's what you got to understand. It is never okay, ever, to hit, punch, or slap a child. It is never okay to do that, ever. So you need to hear that clearly. In fact, you need to understand it because behind discipline is love. It's love. Look at this next verse. It says, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Amen. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Okay, now hold on. By this, Paul means that, listen, don't be so consistently hard on your kids that it makes them angry and turns their hearts away from you. Okay, look, not that your kids are going to just love being disciplined. Okay, they're not. They might even be mad at you for a brief moment. But Paul's not talking about that. He's talking about being so hard on your kids all the time that it turns their hearts against you. And so here's what he says. He says, instead, bring them up in the training, circle the word training, and instruction. Circle the word instruction. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Listen, the point of discipline is not just punishment. The point of discipline is training and instruction. And if, listen, and if you discipline your children without training and instruction, you are missing the point of biblical instruction entirely. Which means, which means, you should never spank your kids when you're, when you're angry. Because if you spank your kids when you're angry, all they learn in that moment is to fear you. And that's not really what you, what you want to teach them. And so listen, so if you're angry, listen, you send them to their room. Not so they can calm down, but so that you can calm down. And then once you've got, gathered yourself, then you can go back in and you can discipline them. And that may or may not include a spanking. But listen, the, remember, the point of discipline is not just to punish. The point is to teach. And if your kids know that the point of your discipline is to teach, your kids will never resent it. Now, they might not like it. In fact, if they do like it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> but they won't resent it. Because you're teaching them, and you might even say this to them, that the reason you're disciplining them is because you love them too much to let them grow up to be a dirty, rotten kid. And that foundation of love that drives discipline forms the foundation of a friendship that will last a lifetime. That's the point. Now, while we're talking about parents and kids, let me briefly talk about kids who are dealing with aging parents because we do have people who are in that situation who are listening today. And I'm going to give you one word. I want to give you just, just, just one word that will guide every decision you'll ever have to make when you're dealing with aging parents. And th this one, one word will clarify every difficult decision. And, by the way, this one word comes from the Bible. And that one word is the word honor. Honor. Now, I didn't print this verse for you in your bulletin, but... Commandment number five out of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and mother. And a lot of times we think about that verse in terms of like little kids honoring their parents. But it also applies to adult kids honoring their aging parents. In fact, that's the context in which Jesus uses it in the New Testament. And so when you're dealing with aging parents, honor them. And this one word will guide every decision that you have to make when it comes to money or to memory care or to medical care or to whatever else you might have to deal with. Honor. One last thought, and then we're finished. Look, parenting is just way too hard to do by yourself. You need God to fight for you, and he will. If you will be still, 
not take matters in your own hands and do it your way, but instead do it his way. Now that is predicated on you having a relationship with God through Christ. So if there's never come a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life to forgive you and committed to following him, then you need to start there. And so if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to ask Jesus to come into your life to guide you and to help you, not just with parenting, but literally with everything in life, then there's a prayer that you can pray. It's at the bottom of your message notes. I want you to pray that prayer while I pray for all of us. And make sure you're here next week because next week we're going to talk about what God says to do when we're just so done with feeling alone. It's going to be so good. So bow your head, close your eyes, and if you need to pray that prayer to become a Christ follower, you do that right now. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you give us just such good, practical advice as parents on how to do things your way. And so, Lord, I ask that you would unwind the things that we've just accumulated over the years from either culture or from our own parents growing up, and you would instead rewrite our way of thinking to your way of thinking. And so help us to parent your way. So that in the end, not only will our kids be good people and follow you and be happy, but that we can also be friends with them. Do this in us and through us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.